So I'm a third generation North Carolina banjo player. My grandfather played banjo, kind of a claw hammer style, old time style. And my dad kind of thumped around on one two finger style. And it, no, they just did it for fun. There was nothing outside of that. But there was always a banjo around the house. My middle brother, Alan, is 10 years older than me. And he had a Flat and Scruggs record, greatest hits kind of thing. And Foggy Mountain Breakdown happened to be on there. The original recording from 1949. Jim Mills was just about five years old when he fell in love with bluegrass music. I didn't know what a banjo was, a guitar, or anything else. I just knew that sound drew me to it. I was like a moth to a flame. I couldn't get close enough to that speaker cabinet, and I just stuck my head up on it until the song went off. And I wanted to play it again, and I wanted to play it again. Without any formal training, Durham County's Jim Mills taught himself how to pick like his musical hero. If this was an upgraded banjo. This was one of the earliest conversions that you'll see. This was I think I got serious about trying to figure it out when I was about 10 and uh, trying to figure out what Earl Scruggs was doing, you know. By the time he finished high school, Mills had graduated from backyard picker into full-time musician. I got a call one day from a local, I say local, they were in Mount Airy, a band called Summer Wages, and I worked with those guys for about two and a half years. Mills then received an offer to join Dole Lawson in his band, Quicksilver. One of the first shows I ever did with Doyle Lawson, we went on a six-week trip to, to South America. So that was a huge eye-opener for a country boy here from North Carolina. Never been much away from home. After touring nonstop for nearly five years, Mills decided to take a break from the road until one day... Ricky Skaggs called me, and uh, he was going back to Bluegrass. I told him, boy, I'd love to go to work for you, but I, I don't care anything at all about moving to Nashville. And he said, we'll make it work. 14 years, he flew me back and forth to Nashville, so I'll always be grateful for that. During that time, Mills was considered one of the best bluegrass banjo pickers in the world. I can hear the sing a song well, in that time period that I worked for Ricky, I won a uh, six-time International Bluegrass Music Award Banjo Player of the Year Award. I think that's the most anybody's been awarded, and I'm very thankful for that. And also six Grammy Awards, so... That's great. I think somebody told me that day, I don't know if it's true or not, they said Elvis only had one. I said, my goodness, that's unbelievable. <laughs> By 2010, Mills decided to take another break from the road. He stepped down from Ricky Skaggs and Kentucky Thunder to dedicate himself to a side business he'd been building for the last two decades. I specialize in what's known today as pre-war Gibson banjos, and that was banjos that were designed uh, well, mainly in the 1920s and 30s up until the end of World War II. They're also considered the epitome of a bluegrass banjo simply because Earl Scruggs played one and uh, recorded one his whole career. Ever since Mills first heard Earl Scruggs play Foggy Mountain Breakdown, he has been obsessed with the sound of these pre-war five-string Gibson banjos. The sound is so subjective, but if I had to describe it, it would be, first of all, powerful. They're very powerful. <laughs> And by that I mean you can play them light and they'll produce what you want. Or if you really get after them and play them hard, they, they don't lay down. Their tone is unique in that it can be a cracking, kind of bright tone, but then it'll be a mellow and warm, rich sound. Over the years, Mills has become a steward for these rare Gibson banjos. I look at it like I'm just a caretaker for this generation. If the world stands, somebody else will be playing it after I'm gone, hopefully. Each instrument has a unique story, and Mills sees himself as much as a historian as a collector. One thing, I try to document as much history on any of them that I can, and a lot of times you won't know anything. It was just found in a pawn shop in 1966 in Cincinnati, Ohio, but then sometimes they have a, a world of history on it. That's a Bill Worrell RB75 banjo we looked at here earlier. That's one of my favorite banjos to play, but I love this photo. I often say to make a great album cover. That's a picture of his little brother, Gilbert. That was taken in 1947 up around Camp Creek, West Virginia. This is also the same banjo here. That's Mr. Worrell playing it in 1947. And uh, it's got a little piece of something white on the head. And I asked him what that was. He said it was a piece of tape. The calfskin head was busted. <laughs> so that's, that's neat to have. I love the history as much as I love the banjo. 
with prices ranging from $5,000 to several hundred thousand dollars. These pre-war Gibson banjos attract a knowledgeable and passionate crowd. There's been such a stereotype placed on the banjo and hillbilly music and hay bales and bib overalls and that kind of snaggle to people and uh, it couldn't be further from the truth, Dave. It's, uh, a lot of my clients are doctors and lawyers, surgeons, uh, high-ranking military people, judges, just a little bit of everything. And uh, there's all kind of people into these banjos. Steve Martin was here. Of course, he's a fan of Earl Scruggs for sure and a great banjo player. Steve bought a banjo from me. I think he still plays on occasion quite often. And uh, he got his picture in front of the old Flatt and Scruggs thing. Over the years, Mills has assembled one of the largest collections of pre-war banjos in the world. His Durham County showroom is part museum, part sales floor, and full-time enjoyment. If you're passionate about what you do, there's so many people in this world that have a job that they absolutely dread getting up in the morning and going to, and I've always loved my job. I love playing the banjo. I love buying and selling and trading them. I love fooling with them, and if you're passionate about it, I think you're you're gonna be better at it. I wake up of a morning thinking about them. I look for them all the time in every place you can imagine. People ask me all the time, they say, boy, you sure are lucky you find all these banjos. I think they think sometimes people bring them to my front door and knock on the door and say, I said, well, you can call it lucky if you want to. I said, the harder I work, the luckier I seem to get.